Well, thank you so much for that song. I love that. I love the words in that song. They're so fitting for uh, the passage that we're going to be spending time in today and really the focus of the sermon. So let's pray before we start. Father, We proclaim your glory alone because it is all about what you have done for us, how you have preserved your word, how you've given it to us today, or your word of life. We recognize that faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Lord, and we praise you for the fact that we have your word today, for all that was sacrificed and all that was given for us to have your words, the words of life, words that, that transform us and make us more like you, words of hope and words of challenge, words of inspiration, words that pierce our souls to the depths of our being. Lord, we pray this morning that you would do that, Lord, that you would, uh, again, inspire us, make us more like you, Lord, that, that my words would be your words and And Lord, I I just thank you for the opportunity to stand here before your people and share your words. Lord, it is only by what you have done that I can do so. In your name, amen. Well, have you ever felt like you were taken advantage of or unappreciated? I'm sure we all have felt that way at some point. Maybe you can think of a specific instance where where this happened, and, and you remember it vividly. Or maybe a couple instances I remember for me one time I had somebody uh, ask me to put gas in their car. Okay, that's a great thing. You know, I thought, here's a, here's a tangible need that I can meet. Um, so I thought, you know, I can't be taken advantage of. Maybe the, the money isn't going to be spent on the wrong thing. So I'm going to go do this. And so I, we went and I got this, this gentleman some gas. And it only filled up about one gallon. About one gallon. I thought, what in the world? He, and, and he said, oh, you know, I forgot to tell you, he said, there were some rags. The person I bought the, the car from, they put rags in the gas tank. And, uh, and they said, so because there's so many rags in there, you can't fill up the tank all the way, so I'm only going to be able to get, like, you know, uh, maybe 15 miles, and i got to go, you know, 60 miles, so I, I need some cash, some money that will get me to my destination. And I thought to myself, I'm not that stupid, man. <laughs> And so I said, no, man, I said the deal was I'd fill your gas tank. That's what you wanted. So I, I filled it. And he said, oh, okay, well, well could, could you get me a, a drink? Could you get me a drink inside? Could you get? And I said, no, well, how about a piece of pizza? It was like never ending. And I thought, oh, my goodness, I, I didn't know what to say. I felt bad telling him no. But I just, at that moment, I, from the, from once the rag story came out, I initially felt like, okay, I'm being taken advantage of here. And nobody likes to be taken advantage of, Right. No one likes to to feel like the person that you're helping is ungrateful for what you have done and it looks at you as a resource rather than a person, right? Because that's how I felt. I'm just a resource. He doesn't care about me. He He just wants to use me. Thankfulness is something that is missing in our society in many ways, is it not? Being thankful for even the country that we live in. That's why this weekend was a good weekend for us, and it's encouraging to see people being thankful for the sacrifices that was made for the freedoms that we have. And our, our, our study this morning is gonna point us towards even how America received the freedoms that we have. The very foundations of our country really come from the Reformation a split of church and state, and the power of government coming into religion. You see, we've lost a thankfulness. Uh, I was reading a book recently, and, and uh, a man named Dr. Crawford Loritz uh, w- was on a journey with his son to North Carolina. Uh, they were visiting Billy Graham's uh, compound, I guess, there, and they were visiting that, and he was actually going to be speaking at this, at this compound. He's a popular pastor and preacher and, and author, and he was taking his son, and he thought, you know what, we're only going to be about half an hour away from where our, our, our great-grandparents, your great-grandparents, my grandparents uh, were buried. 
and he took them to this graveyard where it was mostly full of former slaves. And through tears, he started explaining to his son that these men and women paid our tuition, the words that he says. They have paid our tuition, which means what they sacrificed and what they did and what they went through and, and, on, and everything that, that they did is, is, we are experiencing the joys and the blessings and the freedoms because of what they did. So he said, son, never forget that. It was a high price that they paid. So, so don't waste it. Don't waste the opportunity that you have. You see an intense, intense thankfulness for what someone has done for us in the past and really what God has done for us ignites us, ignites our passions and our, inspires us to be more and to do more and to not take advantage and be unthankful for what has been given to us. Hebrews 12, 1 is our focus passage this morning. So turn with me to Hebrews 12, 1. In your pew Bible, that is page 1008. Page 1008. Popular passage here. Therefore, pointing us back to Hebrews chapter 11, which is the, what you call the hall of faith. It's, if you read through chapter 11, it's all about uh, all of the patriarchs and really matriarchs throughout the Old Testament that point to how God worked through these people and how God worked through their faith alone. Faith alone. And so you get to chapter 12, and he says this, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is before us. Therefore, all these men and women that gave up their very lives for us, remembering what they did, and remembering what God did through them because of their faith, let us run this race with perseverance and endurance, and let us run across that finish line. And then towards the end of chapter 12, in verse 28 and 29, this is after he talks about Adam, the, or the blood of Abel, and how the, the blood of Christ speaks a better wor- word. The blood of Abel was was, sh- was uh, shed by Cain immediately after the curse of sin was brought into the world and that blood was, was crying out from the ground for justice and ever since that happened, the blood of men and women and the injustices in this world are crying out for God to bring about his justice and wrath on mankind and yet Jesus came and it spoke a better word because it was the ultimate sacrifice for that justice that was crying out from the ground. You see, Jesus dying on the cross for our sin. That was, he, he mentions that here in chapter 12 in verse 24. And then getting down to the end, it says this. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Let us be grateful. Let us be thankful for the kingdom that we have that cannot be shaken, will not be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Powerful, powerful passage. You see, here, the author of Hebrews is is speaking to the Jewish Christians, and he's saying, think about all that was given for you, and think about how God, this was all consummated when God brought his son Jesus, who was faithful beyond what any person could possibly be faithful and died on that cross for our sins and that he has given us this everlasting kingdom that can be never taken away. Be thankful for that and grateful for it because God is a consuming, powerful fire that consumes us and changes us and transforms us from the inside out. Today, we have a lot more history that has happened since then, have we not? A lot more history. Today I'd like to look back on on what has been sacrificed for us to be where we are today. 
for us to have the word of God completed for us, the scriptures that bring about life to our soul, that, that give us faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God, amen? And so we have been given the very words of God. How do we have this word of God? So many people don't realize what has been sacrificed for us to have this. And so as we do the same thing as the Hebrew, in Hebrews, the author of Hebrews says to do, is to look back, I pray that God would work in our hearts in such a way to where we would be so thankful that we would take this word and we would put it into use. And we would let it transform our lives. Because today, more than ever, we need this. We have so many distractions out there all the time that it's, this book can tend to sit on a shelf. Uh, Jeff Crosby, I told him I was going to pick him on him this morning. He, he has this a website, or not a website, it's a Facebook page, you know, Facebook page. Uh, and and it, says, it says, read me on a dusty Bible. And the Facebook page is all about going to the Word of God and, and wrestling with the Word of God and wrestling with theology. And I've really enjoyed this last week, getting into some good discussions, uh, different viewpoints, but even the fact that we can even do that, that we have the word of God to wrestle with is because of the sacrifices that has been made. In our statement of faith, if you go on our website as a church, uh, uh, our church website, if you look under uh, about us and you click down on statement of faith, right away at the very beginning is our statement on the Bible. Next week we're gonna deal with the first part of it. Today we're gonna deal with the second part of it which says this, and I think that this is on the PowerPoint, we believe the Bible to be the true center of Christian unity. I think it's the next, there it is, right at the bottom. I can, okay, I can see it. We believe the Bible to be the true center of Christian unity and the supreme standard by which all human conduct, creed, and opinions shall be tried. That the word of God is our authority and it is by the word of God that all doctrine comes out of. All conduct for life, everything comes from the word of God. This is our foundation. And, And I love the way that is worded. A look at the Reformation shows us why, why this is so important that the word of God is our sole authority. It shows us why it's important, and it also points to the fact that we should be very, very thankful. Very, very thankful. Um, When you think of the Reformation, everybody thinks of a guy named Martin Luther, like this picture I have. (laughs) This was Halloween this year, and uh, I think it was Cheryl Kosterison who sent me this, Uh, but, Little, little boy there dressed like Martin Luther. Everybody thinks of Martin Luther, which is, which is appropriate because it was a key moment in the Reformation. But there's a lot more that goes into the Reformation than Martin Luther. God was at work and he was using countless, I mean thousands and thousands of people to bring about the Reformation against the power at the time. You see, for many centuries, many, many centuries, there was no access to the word of God. Also known as the dark ages. The dark ages. Now, I don't know if you've ever talked to somebody who tends to to think or believe that, that Christianity is responsible for the dark ages, and they usually use that argument to say that biblical Christianity is a sham and, and that biblical Christianity is a joke and it is a cancer in society and it will only do what the dark ages did. The sad thing is, is those people do not realize that the word of God is what brought us out of the dark ages. The word of God is what gave us freedom. The word of God is what caused people to even want to read in the first place. People who were uneducated that didn't even ever know how to read and didn't have any motivation to know how to read, when the word of God became available to them through the printing press at the time and through the sacrifices that were made, people wanted to know what God's word said because they'd seen enough oppression by powerful people who kept people from having the word of God. You see, they don't realize that. 
First thing I want to focus on here is the foundation for human conduct and doctrine. And is that, that is what is in our statement of faith there. And that is sola scriptura. Sola scriptura. There, we're going to go through the five solas. You have on one side of this PowerPoint, you have the reformers' views. And on the other side, if we could get that up as well, you have the problem with the church. Okay, it's the next slide after that. Okay, it's not on there. Okay, I'll just, I'll just say it. So you have a once, really, we're going to compare the problems with the church at the time to sola scriptura and the reformers' views. You see, at the, at the base, you see at the very bottom, there is sola scriptura, which is mean uh, all doctrine and conduct of life, just like we said in our, in our doctrinal statement from our church, flows from the Bible. The Bible is the foundation, and everything should flow from that. Then you have solus Christus, which is Christ alone. Christ alone. Then you have solified, which is, which is faith alone. Then you have sola gratia, which is grace alone. This is all pointing to salvation. You see, this was in a time when, when uh, the, the Pope controlled the people because they did not have the word of God, and, and there was... There was none of this. It was really all about indulgences and using, using uh, people's money to give them salvation. The Pope gave you salvation, and the Pope also could condemn you to hell, as we will see in a little bit. These were the problems that existed in the church. The problem, the, the core issue of the, of the Catholic Church back then was that papal authority and infallibility the belief in papal authority and infallibility, which is the power of the Pope, and when the Pope is in his place of, uh, of office, that he, he can do no wrong when he speaks on authority, and, or he speaks on doctrine, and when he speaks in the Bible. He can say no wrong, he can do no wrong, so when a Pope says, this is how it's gonna be, that's like hearing from God. That's hearing straight from God. And that was what caused all the problems during the Dark Ages. It started out not near a, a, as bad as it got way into the dark ages. The beginning, they just believed Peter, you know, passed it on down, and so, well, well, I guess we have the same power, and then eventually it got worse and worse and worse. They believed that they had the same power as the apostles, and even the apostles didn't have that power because Peter was called out by, by Paul for, for uh, being really kind of racist towards the Jews at the time and backing away, or no, the, sorry, towards the Gentiles. He backed away from the Gentiles. He didn't want to be associated with them because of his Jewish friends. So we don't even see that from the original apostles, but this power was given to the Pope where he was able to control people, and this is where you had the Crusades came from this. Three things came out of this that were clearly not biblical. First, the Crusades. When Jesus died on that cross, before he died on that cross, his disciple tried to cut off the um, guard's ear. And Jesus put his ear back on and healed him and took the sword away because he was not about bringing about his kingdom through the sword. He said, if my kingdom was of this world, I would be fighting. But he came to lay down his life. And the Crusades were about bringing about God's kingdom through the killing and, and murder of many, many, many people. Now granted, the, the Islam was taking over, so they were fighting against that, so it was political, but it was also spiritual. So if you didn't, you didn't become a Christian, they just kill you. See, that was the Crusades. That is not anywhere in scripture, we do not see that anywhere in the New Testament church. In fact, it was the exact opposite. But because of the power of the Pope, they were able to, to control people and and pursue their own personal agenda because they were infallible. Secondly, purgatory. We discussed this uh, a while back in a couple sermons, so I'm not gonna repeat this sermon, but the sermon was uh, probably about two months ago, what happens after I die? If you wanna look into purgatory and what the scriptures say about purgatory, you can look online and find out more about purgatory and why scriptures do not teach purgatory, but that came out of papal authority and infallibility, teaching this doctrine. And because of purgatory, you had indulgences. Now this was the big issue that brought about the Reformation. 
the indulgences. Because you could pay for salvation, you could pay for less time in purgatory, you could pay for your family and your friends and your loved ones to be, to be taken out of purgatory and into heaven because the Pope had authority to do that. So you'd pay the Pope money and the king would also get a cut on those indulgences. So politics and religion went hand in hand. So the king got a cut out of this out of this money that was given to the church, but most of it went to the church, and you had guys like uh, Tenzel, were, which were telling people, uh, pleading with them to give indulgences to the church, because if, if you pay money and you get your family members out of purgatory, don't you hear that they are begging for you to have mercy and give them some money? They took care of you while you were here on earth. Don't you wanna let them out of purgatory? You see the manipulative behavior that happened because of papal authority and because of the indulgences and purgatory and all of these doctrines that came out of papal, papal authority and infallibility. And the reformists started to see that this was so wrong, so corrupt. So they, they went to scripture and as they were preaching in their churches, these are Catholic churches they're preaching in, they started seeing this is just wrong. This is not what scripture teaches. And they started seeing how the Pope was using people to fund these beautiful, beautiful churches. And they were like, this is just not right. They had just had the the plague, the black plague come up across Europe. People were dying and poor and broken and still the church was, was using poor people to build these beautiful buildings instead of helping the people. We need to be thankful for the word of God. Secondly, we need to be thankful for the word of God. Why? How did the word of God and the people and the sacrifices that they did, how did that bring them out of the Reformation? There's a couple groups of people that I want to focus on. One was the Waldensians. Many people today do not know much about the Waldensians. It started by Peter Waldo in 1170. Peter Waldo uh, believed that People should have the right to have personal study of scripture and people should and also have the right of the priesthood of the believer. That the believer can go to God and pray to God direct and they do not need to go through the church for prayer, confession, and they can go straight to God for confession. This is what he believed and this came out of his own personal study of the scriptures. He gave up all of his wealth, of his wealth and he started a movement that valued these, these things that are listed up here. They translated some of the Bible into the, into the common language of the people, from the Latin. They translated it from the Latin into the common language of the people so that they could read it, and then they also believed in the atoning death and justifying righteousness of Christ. That was on Christ alone, solus Christus. They also denied purgatory and indulgences. Did not see that anywhere in scripture. And they were against the use of force, especially the Crusades. Now, the sad thing about this is, is that the Catholic Church at that time decided to uh, cast out, send out a crusade against the Waldensians, and many of them were killed. Many of them were killed. As we go through this, I'd like to kind of go back to Hebrews 11 consistently through this and see how these people are very similar to to those of faith in Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, 37 through 38 says this. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were killed with the sword, they went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. That is what these people went through. As the crusade went out against them, they fleed into the mountains and they hid and they, they suffered like nobody else of their time. Many of them were murdered and many of them uh, were in hiding during this time. Still today, there are Waldensians that exist today. 
and that if, they're called different, different groups, but they were all throughout Europe, these Waldensians. And they stood for the word of God, and they stood for the, the Christ alone, and, they, and they, they, they stood against some of these false teachings that, were, that existed in the church, and it cost them their very lives. These are, many people refer to them as the, the pre-reformers. The pre-reformers. You see, these people uh, had, had writings and, and they, they had started bringing the Bible into the common language and guys like Martin Luther and guys like, like John Huss and, and Wycliffe and Tyndale were reading their writings. So that's why they call them the pre-reformers. And I'm not gonna be able to hit on every single person here today, but the next one I'd like to talk about is John Huss. John Huss preached in the Czech Republic, which was known as Bohemia back then, at Bethlehem Chapel. After receiving his doctorate degree, he preached at Bethlehem Chapel. He became increasingly aware of the corruption in the church. And because of his teaching against purgatory and against indulgences and against papal authority, he was excommunicated by the king. The king excommunicated him because, again, the king is taking a cut from the indulgences that the church received, and he didn't like not getting his money. So they excommunicated him. And then while he was excommunicated, he said this, Christ alone is the head of the church. He wrote this and, and gave it to the people to spread about the people. He said, Christ alone is head of the church. A pope, through ignorance and love of money, can make many mistakes and he encouraged them to rebel against an erring pope is to obey Christ. To rebel against an erring pope is to obey Jesus. That's what he was doing. And so he, was in, he, he ended up being captured. They condemned him to hell. And then after they condemned him to hell, the Pope condemned him to hell. After the Pope condemned him to hell, they turned him over to the king, and the king burned him at the stake. This is a man that gave his life and went through extreme torture so that we could have these beliefs in sola scriptura, the word of God today. Countless people went through this. These are just the popular names. There was many, many people that went through this and were burned at the stake by the state and the church both. This is what he said as he was dying. Grant me a brave, this is right before he died, grant me a brave spirit and fearless heart, perfect love and hope that I may lay down my life. Lord Jesus, it is for thee that I patiently endure this cruel death. I pray thee to have mercy on my enemies. Man. If that doesn't inspire you to want to forgive our enemies today who might have said a gossiping word about us or, or frustrated us in some way, I don't know what does. This guy was burned at the stake and he's asking for forgiveness of the people that wanted him burnt at the stake. He was heard reciting the Psalms as he died. As the flames engulfed him. Hebrews 11.1 1 makes me think of John Huss. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, for by it the people of old received their co commendation. Think of that. This is a man with great faith, great faith to endure burning at the stake because he, of his convictions that the scriptures alone should be the authority and that, and that it is on Christ alone and what he has done for us on the cross and no amount of giving money to the church will get you out of hell or out of purgatory. That is only on Christ alone. This man gave up his life because of his great faith. Man, I hope I have faith like that. If I were ever to be faced with something like this, I hope and pray that I would have faith like that. And the only way that I can know it is how am I reacting to challenges in everyday life? to the little challenges that come my way. Do I, do I handle them with faith? Or, or, or do I, am I filled with worry and anxiety and wanting to control everything in my life, or do I handle them with gracious faith like men of old, like John Huss? 
The last person, of course, we need to talk about is Martin Luther. Martin Luther uh, lived in, from 1483 to 1546. He wrote about John Huss that he could not understand why and for what cause they had burnt so great a man who explained the scriptures with so much bravery and skill. Now, Martin Luther's life is a very interesting one. He had a very strict father growing up. He ended up going into uh, the monastery, becoming a monk, because uh, three of his friends died from the Black Death. Three of his friends died, and right around the same time, he was on a journey somewhere, and there was this thunderstorm, and he saw lightning struck right beside him. Now, I've never, I've seen lightning in a distance. I've always wanted to see it right close beside me, but I don't think that I would want to if I wasn't in a car. He's on a horse, and, and the lightning strikes right beside him, and it freaks him out. He lost three of his friends to the Black Death, and he decides to become a monk with the goal of having assurance of salvation through a, a life of denial of self-pleasure is really what the life of a monk was all about. Denial of the self. All kinds of disciplines that he engaged in. All kinds of disciplines. Even to the point of self-harm. Trying to gain the favor of his father by his, by his heavenly father through his own works and his own denial of, the, the, of selfish pleasure he was trying to gain the love and acceptance and grace and mercy of his father through works, and he could not do it. And it about drove him mad. To when one time he was studying Romans, preparing to preach on Romans, and when he was going through Romans, in Romans chapter one, right at the beginning, he started to see, and his eyes were opened, and he started to see the grace and love that his heavenly father had for him the grace and love that Jesus had for him, and that he recognized that it was on f by faith alone in receiving this free gift of salvation that he can have favor with his heavenly Father, that the wrath of God I I is on him until he accepts the free gift of salvation, and that no, no, matter, no amount of works could get him to his heavenly Father. There is no way that he, a sinner, could get to his heavenly Father on his own. His eyes were open to the love and grace and mercy and the offer of a free gift of salvation through repentance. And he says this, I love this statement. He felt as if he was born again and entered into heaven already. We're not at this last PowerPoint yet. He felt like he was, he was born again and entered into heaven already. Wow. Now that is what born again really feels like, is it not? When, when, when you feel the love and grace and mercy of God, and you've been try, striving and striving on your own good, trying to get there by your own good deeds, there is a weight that comes off of you, just as Martin Luther says here. When I think of Martin, Lu Martin Luther, I think of this, Hebrews eleven six. 6, without faith, it is impossible to please him. He was trying to do it, and it was impossible. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. You see, faith opens one's heart to the working of God inside of somebody's life. Instead of doing it yourself, opening your heart to God and allowing God to work, that's what faith does. And that's what faith did in saving Martin Luther and saving John Huss, but it's also what faith did in bringing us the Bible today that they lived on this faith, and because they lived on this faith, that they were even willing to give up their lives, and that through that, God was able to work in a miraculous way and bring about the freedom of his people from a dark age, a very, very dark age. I'm gonna read to you a couple of Martin Luther's thesis, because we talk a lot about his 95 thesis. Martin Luther, as he was seeing what was wrong with the Catholic Church, went and he nailed on the door of, I forget what it's called, Wittenberg, 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 whatever, one of those Bergs. He went and not, nailed it on the door, I always get bad with those names. He nailed it on the door, his 95 thesis, 
And, and this is what, he, th- these are some of them. These are some of the ones that I wanted to, to, to focus on this morning. Thesis number 36. Every truly repentant Christian has a right to full remission of penalty and guilt, even without letters of pardon. All of this is against indulgences. Second, thesis number 45, Christians are to, to be, are to be taught that if he sees a man in need and passes him by and gives money for pardons, purchases not the indulgences of the Pope, but the indignation of God himself. You see, people were so poor at the time, people were starving, and, and they would pass up a man starving to go and purchase indulgences from the Pope to hopefully get out of purgatory. Third, thesis number 46, Christians are to be taught that unless they have more than they need, they are bound to keep back what is necessary for their own families and by no means to squander it on pardons. Families, children were, weren't, weren't being fed because people were, were buying pardons. There, there was so much fear and guilt at that time that they would buy a pardon before they would feed their own family at times. Thesis number 86, why does the Pope, whose wealth is today greater than the richest of the richest, build just one, just this one church of St. Peter with his own money rather than with money of poor believers? Thesis number 92, away then with all these prophets who say to the people of Christ, peace, peace, and there is no peace. Calling the Pope a false prophet. Now that will get you into trouble. They, they uh, stripped him of his uh, priestly duties. They excommunicated him. He was a dead man walking. His friends uh, uh, kind of abducted him uh, because they didn't want him killed. And they hid him away in a castle. And there he translated the Bible into German, into the German language. And right during the same time, they had the printing press and the Bible started getting into the hands of people. And they started reading the very words of God instead of what other powerful people with, an, with a personal agenda thought they should believe or, or, or encourage them to believe. And it was illegal to have the word of God in your hands at that time. You see, God has done a great work the fact that we have his word in our hands today. This Bible frees us. This Bible is still illegal in some countries because they know it frees people to where they start thinking for themselves and start hearing directly from God and they refuse to obey some person, that, some powerful leader or dictator to get them to, to act a certain way. This word is powerful and it still is illegal today because of that power. A Catholic friend of mine sent me some articles to read this week, and I had my work cut out for me. So I, I read uh, many articles, and, and um, it's very interesting. There were, there were, were a couple things, criticisms, that, that I agreed with that they, they say the Reformation bring, brought about this. Okay, One was, this is a criticism, but also um, something that I like. <laughs> So it's weird. Ordinary men will mishandle the word of God. If you give the word of God into, to ordinary men and women, they will mishandle it. It needs to be with people who are educated. Now, do we see this happening? Yes. We see this happen a lot. People mishandle the word of God. However, the Pope greatly mishandled the word of God. All people, doesn't matter how powerful you are or how much education you have, you can mishandle the word of God because of your own personal agenda, especially if you have power to do so. If you have power and you've been given influence, then you can easily mishandle the word of God. This is why every pastor should say to his congregation, study the word on your own. Study the word of God on your own. And so if I'm ever off Tell me, I want to know it. Bring to me the word of God and say, Pastor, I don't know if you're right on with this one. This scripture passage over here says this, and you're kind of getting off in left field there. You see, it is easy to mishandle the word of God. And R.C. Sproul says this, private interpretation, 
This is the last one up here. Private interpretation never meant that individuals have the right to distort the scriptures. With the right of private interpretation comes the sober responsibility of accurate interpretation. Love that. And today in a culture that we tend, let's just admit it, we tend to be lazy. I mean, we got everything. I don't even have to learn to spell hardly anymore because I got my, my computer that corrects me every time, right? It's so easy to be lazy about stuff, and may we never be lazy when we study God's word. And that is why in our church, we want to truly disciple people. If you have never been discipled and you want to be discipled, please talk to me after the service. What, what, the, biggest, the, the, the largest part of that discipleship process that we go through is how to study the word of God. It's just hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is a methodology methodolo- way of handling the word of God. You can tell as I go through this, there is so much that I, that I did not cover. And I'm not an expert on the Reformation by any means. But I wanted you to have some of these, these truths of history, to have a strong thankfulness and gratitude for what we have today in the word of God. And then we can even take some of these criticisms and apply them to our lives. We need to be willing and ready to interpret scripture accurately and then apply it to our our lives the way that it was intended to be. And be very careful that we don't mishandle the word of God. Secondly, towards the end of Martin's life, he became obsessed with ridding Germany of the Jews. This is a huge critique of Martin Luther and with it they throw the whole Reformation in there. That Martin Luther, at first, he wanted the Jews to come to know Jesus, and there was a lot of anti-Semitism at the time, and, he, and he's, he's quoted as saying, let's, let's, let, let's just be gentle with the Jews and share the gospel with them, and they'll come to know Jesus. And when they didn't come to know Jesus, he became more and more increasingly frustrated with the Jewish people, to the point of racist, racist uh, things that he wrote. He wrote a treatise that... Um, had eight, it was an eight point plan on how to rid Germany of the Jewish people. In fact, there was one moment where he was sick and uh, some Jews came through the area and he blamed that sickness on those Jews. So there's a lot of crazy things that happened towards the end of Martin Luther's life. And you wonder, what in the world? How could a man that was used by God in such great ways be so crazy? And this is what I say. We fix our eyes on who? Jesus. Hebrews 12, 2. Fixing our eyes on Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith. Martin Luther is not the author and perfecter of our faith. Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith. And all of these guys that I mentioned had some kind of shortcoming in their life, just like we do. And all of them were, 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 were capable of caving to the culture around them. And in Martin Luther's time, it was anti-Semitism. In our time, we got a lot of other problems that, that attack the word of God and attack what God wants to do in our life and make us uh, drift away from God's will for our lives. So this is why we need to fix our eyes on Jesus. And as, as Travis comes up to play this last song, and the worship team, I just want to encourage you to take some time and think about how the Word of God has changed you. How has the Word of God changed you in your life? Are you spending time with the Lord? This Word that we have, next week we're going to talk about how God preserved His Word through the years. How we can know, next week is really about how can we know that this Bible has not been changed, that it truly is the Word of God. So we're going to dig into that next week. But my, my question to you is, this Word that God has preserved for us and that people gave their lives so that we could have it, that, that is still the world's number one bestseller today, Why? Because it changes lives. It transforms hearts. It sets men free from the feeling 
that they will never make it to heaven on their own. This word, how, how often do you spend time in it during the week? Do you spend time in the word? Because if you don't, for all you know, I could say something crazy and you wouldn't even know it. But if you're reading the word of God, God will speak directly to you. He will speak directly to you. And if you, if you struggle with, I just don't know how to read it. I mean, it's just so complicated and it's so big. And I encourage you, come get discipled by somebody in our church. We're, we're going through a training process so that we can make disciples. That's what God called us to do. So as they play this last song, they're gonna play some music here for a little bit. I just ask you to bow your head, close your eyes, and think on how the word of God has changed your life. And think of how you can apply this message today. If you need to be discipled and you need to talk to me after the service, let God speak to you. If you want to know how to study the word of God and be able to apply it to to your life directly. So let's bow our heads and they're going to play some music and let the Lord speak to you this morning before we sing this last song.